Augustine is one of the greatest theologians of all time. Born in 354 AD, but he lived a life of debauchery until he came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 31, which is a great story captured in his autobiography, Confessions. So he's wrestling with his sin when one day he feels compelled to open his Bible and read whatever comes across his eyes. What does he read? Romans 13. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So he repents. He believes. And he's totally sold out for Christ. Gives away his wealth, converts his house into a monastery, and studies the Bible with like-minded Christians. Until in 391 AD, he becomes the Bishop of Hippo. And then is used by God for the next 39 years of his life as a pastor, a teacher, a theologian, and an author. In fact, one of his most important books is called City of God which was written in response to the sack of Rome in 410 A.D., which was a massive event because the Roman Empire up to that point had dominated European civilization for nearly a thousand years. So when the Visigoths plundered Rome, it was the first time their walls had ever been breached in over 800 years. And as a result, citizens were devastated and they started making accusations that the devastation was punishment for abandoning their pagan gods in favor of the new state religion, which was Christianity. So Augustine argues in City of God that Christianity is not the problem, but the sinfulness of man. That religion is not found in loving the world nor the things in the world nor in temporal cities like Rome. What matters is not the city of man, but the city of God which Augustine argues is the church, both now in our earthly gatherings and our love for one another and forever when we meet in heaven for all eternity because Jesus will rule and reign over all empires, including Rome, including the United States. And only the church, the people of God, will stand triumphant in the end. Which is where the book of Ephesians comes in. Because it's a book that sings of the glory of Christ and the beauty of the church. So a magnificent combination of Christian doctrine and duty, faith and life, when God has done through Christ and who we're called to be in Christ. So my goal this morning is to review the glory of the gospel just one more time in Ephesians. That we might behold the beauty of Christ And as a result, live gloriously different in the beauty of the church. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6. I encourage you to grab my outline from the bulletin. The title of my sermon this morning is Love Incorruptible. Three points, the conclusion of Ephesians, then the message of Ephesians. Two points there, the beauty of Christ, the beauty of the church. Then we'll end with the application of Ephesians. So I'm going to pick up our passage this morning. It starts in the middle of verse 18. So after highlighting the armor of God, Paul says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love 
incorruptible. I want you to see how this is the perfect conclusion to the book of Ephesians. Because Paul includes the two main points he's been talking about the entire time, specifically A, a practical love for the church, and B, a persevering love for Christ. So a love for Christ, that was the main point of chapters 1 through 3, and a love for the church, that is what we just got done discussing in chapters 4 to 6. But let me show you what I mean, starting in verses 18 to 22, because what is all of this about? But a practical love for the church. We know from the internal evidence of the letter, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, that Paul is currently a prisoner for the Lord, so he's probably in Rome under house arrest, which is where we find him at the end of the book of Acts. So he's a prisoner, he's in chains, he's writing letters, including at minimum the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians, and he's sending them by way of Tychicus, who's delivering them both along with updates. Do you see how that's a practical love for the church? And the church's love for Paul, because he calls and commands these dear believers, first and foremost, to pray for one another. Look at verse 18. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. For who? For all the saints. Not only for all the saints, but for Paul as well. Paul says, pray also for me. Don't just pray for everybody else. Pray for me. That words may be given in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador, notice, in chains. So the first way we demonstrate our love for one another is through prayer. Here's a simple question for you this morning. Are you praying? Are you praying for one another? Do you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ here at Proclamation? Do you set aside time during the day, during the week, to lift up one another in prayer? Maybe even walking through the church directory. That's what the men do in men's prayer on Friday mornings. But here's another great question. Are you praying like this? That we as a church would be bold with the gospel. That we would open our mouths in our current culture, to speak with clarity and courage and deep conviction about the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, those would be good prayers. But what a practical way to demonstrate our love for Christ and our love for one another. But here's another example of practical love in the church. Verses 21 and 22, Paul says, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Now, do you hear how Paul cares more about the church than he does about himself? Remember, right? He's he's in prison, and yet he's not self-consumed. But he's others-oriented. He's not asking for stuff. He's not demanding that people come and see him. But instead, he's sending Tychicus. Why? To give them an update so that they might not worry, so that they might pray knowledgeably for him and for the work of the ministry. But also to send this letter so that their hearts might be encouraged. And what exactly is this letter about? Well, he tells us, doesn't he? It's all about them having, be a persevering love for Christ. I mean, that's exactly what he says in verse 24. He says, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice with a love incorruptible. So a persevering love for Christ. So Paul writes this letter to be read out loud in all the local churches that have been planted, grown up, and are thriving in and around Ephesus. And he's writing to remind them. But to remind them of what? Of the beauty of Christ. The glory of the gospel and the joys that is theirs in Jesus. So it might motivate them to love one another all the more, resulting in the beauty of the church. Which I believe is a message that we need to be reminded of on a daily basis so that we might love one another well here at Christ's Proclamation 
church, delighting in the beauty of Christ that results in the beauty of the church. So knowing that Paul concludes Ephesians with the same ideas that motivated him to write it in the first place, that believers might have a persevering love for Christ that results in a practical love for the church, I want to walk through the book just one more time, that we too might glory in the beauty of Christ, that it might result in the beauty of this particular local church. Which brings us to number two, the message of Ephesians. So if you would flip back to chapter 1, verse 3, and let's review Ephesians. Now Paul comes right out of the gate, doesn't he? Chapter 1, verse 3, with a glorious doxological statement focusing on the beauty of Christ, which is number one, a work of of the Trinity. So Father, Son, and Spirit, all three absolutely critical to our salvation because the Father ordains it, the Son completes it, and the Spirit applies it to our lives as a down payment for all eternity. So again, language I very much want you to remember and I want you to hold on from the book of Ephesians. The salvation that the Father ordains, the Son accomplishes, and the Spirit applies. Look again at verse 3, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He, the Father, chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, before the Father. In love, He, the Father, predestined us for adoption to Himself, to the Father, as sons and daughters, of course through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, the Father's will, to the praise of the Father's glorious grace with which He, the Father, has blessed us in the Beloved, in the Lord Jesus. So God the Father predestined before the foundation of the world that we would be adopted into His family, that we would be sons and daughters of the Most High King. So God the Father, creator and sustainer of the world, the one who spoke creation into being, chose you, adopted you to be his child, set his affection on you to be a son or a daughter in his family. Do you hear what I'm saying? God the Father ordained your salvation. But how did it happen? Well, it happened through God the Son, starting in verse 7. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption. Through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of the Father's grace, which He, the Father, lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of the Father's will, according to the Father's purpose, which He, the Father, sent forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, in Christ, Things in heaven and things on earth. In him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of the Father who works all things according to the counsel of the Father's will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of the Father's glory. So the Father ordains it to the praise of his glory, verse 6, and the Son accomplishes it to the praise of his glory, verse 12. But it's only in Christ that we have redemption. It's only in Him. How? Through His blood. Now just think about that whole idea of redemption. Because the essence of redeeming something, right, by definition, means that you buy something back. But we're not talking here about aluminum cans or glass bottles, are we? No, we're talking about people's souls. So God sets his affection on you, chooses you before the foundation of the world that you might be his son or daughter. But in order for that to happen, Christ has to lay down his life and die in your place. Why? So that he can buy you back and make you his own. And the picture in verse 8 is God pouring out grace upon grace, right? The text says God's grace lavished on us. So Niagara Falls kind of grace, pouring down grace upon grace, grace greater than all our sins. 
Let me ask you, by whom do you feel the most loved this morning? My hope is your husband or your father are at least somewhere at the top of that list. But just think of all the affection and kindness and love and focus and delight that your husband or your father has in his eyes for you. Just think about that reality. But that's a drop in the bucket of what it looks like for God to lavish his grace on you. And it's not just affection, right? It's action. His love looks like something because God the Father ordains your salvation to the praise of his glory, verse 6, and the Son doesn't just try, doesn't just love you. No, he accomplishes it. He finishes it. He willingly redeems you. He willingly, joyfully buys you back through his blood so that you can be a child of God, adopted into his family as a beloved son or daughter to the praise of his glory, verse 12. And how does that get applied to your life? Well, through the work of the Spirit, verse 13. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, believed in who? Believed in Christ, were sealed with what? With the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, of that inheritance, which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. The greatest gift you've ever been given is your eternal inheritance. That is only for you. It's yours. Has your name on it, right? It's, it's sitting there waiting for you for all eternity. The Holy Spirit guarantees that inheritance until you require, until you acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That's the work of the triune God to secure your salvation. The Father ordains it, the Son accomplishes it, and the Spirit applies it which is absolutely beautiful. Did you catch how many times Paul says, in Christ? So for any of these things to be true, we have to find our identity in Jesus. He has to be first in our lives, has to be the priority, that it's only in him that we live and move and have our being. So quick question. Is your identity who you are at the core of your being in Jesus this morning? Or is it in other things, lesser things, things that won't last, things that won't endure to the end? Oh, I appeal to you, find your identity in Christ. It's only in him that you can have redemption, verse 7, through his blood, the forgiveness of your sins, the hope of heaven, according to the riches of God's lavished grace. What does Paul do next? He prays. He prays that we would know that grace. Look with me at verse 15, the prayer for knowledge. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Here's the prayer, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, number one, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So knowing with a profound sense of certainty that heaven is the ultimate place to which you have been called, not the destination, but to be with God for all eternity. Number two, verse 18, that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. 
So the blessing that is here and now as well as later, but notice it's in the saints. So the way in which we're a blessing to one another because we've got the same hope, the same calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's the riches that we have in the church. But is he done? I don't think so. He's just getting started. Number three, that you may know, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Now, I want to remind you, these people are in Ephesus, right? He's writing to the church in Ephesus, which has the eighth wonder of the world, the temple of Artemis, the goddess who's supposed to have, according to the Ephesians, all power. But check out this power, verse 19. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power? God's power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things, not some, all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to who? To the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at God's right hand in the heavenly places is at work in every single believer. That's incredible. But you see that power immediately on display, don't you? Because that's where Paul goes next. Number three, the power of salvation. I mean, can you think of a greater power than to take people who are, according to Paul, verse one, chapter two, right, are dead in their trespasses and sins and makes them alive? Maybe I'm going too fast. Look, look at your Bibles, chapter two, verse one dead you're dead in your trespasses and your sins not partly dead not a little bit dead right all the way dead he takes those who are spiritually dead in their trespasses and their sins and he makes them alive. That's power. That's resurrection power. Do you see that power anywhere else in our world? We can legislate it. We can command it. We can try to enforce it and call for it. Stop behaving like that. Start behaving like this but we cannot accomplish it. This is God's power. He takes those who are dead in their trespasses and sins and he makes them alive. Look at verse four. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised up, notice, with him. And seated, notice, with him. In the heavenly places. In Christ Jesus our Lord. So even when we first come to faith, we're immediately, positionally seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's incredible. That our future hope is so certain that it invades this present reality. Verse seven, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Are you seeing the power of God's salvation? But it's not just the power of God's salvation, it's the power of God's sanctification. 
Because the blood of the cross doesn't just reconcile us to God. The blood of the cross actually reconciles us to one another. So people who are radically different might actually live in peace and harmony and unity with one another. But who are the most radically different people in the world? You might be tempted to look at your spouse. No, it's not men and women, even though we know and get confirmed daily that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. We know that. And no, it's not Democrats and Republicans, although some would say they're from a whole other universe altogether. But it's Jews and Gentiles, which Paul immediately highlights in verses 11 to 22. That's number four, the peace of Christ. But listen to the language, how it's directly tied to the beauty of Christ. Verse 11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that which is made in the flesh by hand. So, so radically different people here, right? One called the circumcision, other called the uncircumcision. Jews and Gentiles, total opposites. Verse 12, remember that you Gentiles were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. Here's the summary. Having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far off and been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Are you catching the relational language here? Starting with the idea of being far off and being brought near. So Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens, outcasts on the fringe, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members relationally, think that way, of God's family. How does that happen? Verse 13, by the blood of Christ, who is our peace. Now, is Paul talking here about inner peace? Is he talking about peace of mind or peace in your own soul? No, he's talking about peace with one another, peace between people who are radically different, far more different than any of the people sitting right next to you this morning. Jesus is our peace, our relational peace. And because of the glory of the gospel, he empowers us to be reconciled to one another, breaks down the dividing wall of hostility and creates in the church one new man. He's creating a whole new humanity. Again, the beauty of Christ that results in the beauty of the church. In fact, I would suggest you cannot separate the beauty of Christ from the beauty of the church, which is what Paul says next. Number five, the mystery revealed. This should blow your minds. Unbelievable. Let's pick it up in Ephesians 3 verse 6. Paul says this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. What grace, Paul? To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? Here it is, verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rules and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to his eternal purpose that God has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Do you understand what he's saying? He's arguing that the church has always been the Father's plan. 
He says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. This was according to God's eternal purpose that he has now realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So our salvation that the Father ordained, the Son accomplished, and the Spirit applied to each one of our lives, the beauty of Christ was always intended to result in the beauty of the church. That was God's eternal plan. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that according to the Bible, there is no Christianity apart from the church. There is no isolated, just me and God kind of a Christianity. Christianity always works itself out in and through a community of believers, which means we have work to do. Why do I say that? Well, because relationships take work. They always take work. They take time and effort. They take understanding and stepping on one another's toes. They take Arguments and apologies, forbearance and forgiveness, communication, asking good questions, listening, trusting one another's answers. Relationships take work. In fact, I was thinking about it this week. Do you know what relationships are like in my home? They're like my son, Jeremiah walking around my house. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I love Jeremiah very much. I talked to him about this illustration. His feelings are not going to be hurt. You don't need to look at him while I'm telling you the illustration. He's going to be laughing. He's going to say, this is what he says. He's like, that's true. That's true. Okay? Here's how I lovingly, kindly, graciously refer to Jeremiah in my house right now at this age. He's my walking wrecking ball. That's what it seems like to me, right? Why why do I call him my walking wrecking ball? Well, because he breaks. To me, seems like literally everything that he touches. (laughs) I'll give you a quick example, right? This week, I gave him a watch, a really, really nice watch, an Iron Man watch, so that we could work out together over the course of this summer. And in one day, I gave him the watch, same day, took the watch, put it on, walked away, came back to me, broken. (laughs) How do you break an Iron Man watch? How do you even do that? It's an Iron Man watch, but apparently it's not a Jeremiah James watch. (laughs) That would be a whole other level of watch, wouldn't it? Here's my point. J.J. is a walking wrecking ball. And everything that he touches breaks and requires me work. (laughs) But that's what relationships are like. Relationships always require work. Here's the hard part of my analogy. Because so often, we're the relational wrecking ball, aren't we? We're part of the problem, some way, shape, and form, when relationships go bad. By the way, that's why Paul says in chapter 4, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. He doesn't say... Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from everybody around you because you live perfectly righteous and always kind and gracious and loving to everybody else. No, he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you and me, along with all malice. That's the hard work that we need to do. Being kind to one another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So again, the beauty of Christ results in the beauty of the church. But that takes work, doesn't it? But because we've been forgiven of our sin, 
reconciled to God for all eternity because we know that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We're motivated and we want nothing more than for God to be glorified in the beauty of this particular local church, which is absolutely beautiful when it happens. But it does take work. That's why Paul starts off chapter 4 the way he does. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this is clearly, number one, the call to unity. But I just want you to think about the hard work needed to maintain relationships in the church. Paul says, I urge you, I encourage you to walk, to keep going, to keep working. But how? With all humility. So not consumed with self, not arrogant, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, but thinking more highly of other people, appreciating their gifting, so how great they are, not how great you are. My goodness, that's a full-time job in and of itself, isn't it? Then he says, with all gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, what does it mean to bear with one another? It means to recognize people are different than you. They're not right. They're not wrong. They're just different. They have preferences that are different than your preferences. So really just the ABCs of relationships. A is the fact that we accept and we appreciate people who are different than us. Knowing B, differences require and bring balance. And C, that we must and need to constantly communicate about these things. And what's the upshot of this whole orientation? It's unity and it's peace. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. Which is absolutely beautiful when it happens. The beauty of the gospel affecting every single area of our lives as we live it out together in this community. Again, the beauty of Christ resulting in the beauty of the church. And number two, the Lord Jesus has given each of us gifts to make that happen. Look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 11. And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain, notice, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So the goal of gifts is not for your own glory, but to serve others, for building up the body of Christ until we all are unified as a church around the knowledge of the Son of God. And it's not just for the big boys, right? It's not just for the apostles, prophets, shepherds, and teachers. It's for everyone to do that good work. That's what he says in verse 11. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we all are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So everyone is gifted differently by God, but for the common purpose of unity and harmony and peace, making the body grow so the church, the people of God, build up one another in love. And that was God's plan from eternity past. This is his eternal purpose. That he would call a people to himself who live gloriously different, loving God and loving one another. The beauty of Christ resulting in the beauty of the church. But that requires some things, doesn't it? Number three, it requires the change of character and it requires the walk of unity. 
So walking in love, walking as light, and walking in wisdom. Look at verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of your minds. In contrast, verse 20, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Here's the change of character. Verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, which obviously looks like something. Verse 25, not lying, but speaking the truth. Verse 26, not being angry and checking out, but engaging. Verse 28, not stealing, but sharing. Verse 29, not, not wicked words, but edifying speech. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, but instead be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. How do we do that? As Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us. And it's not just walking in love that promotes unity, but walking in light, verse 8. Walking in wisdom, verse 15. When he says walk in wisdom, is he talking about the wisdom of this world? Right? Understanding calculus, balancing your checkbook, and climbing the corporate ladder? No, he's talking about wisdom in relationships. For example, husbands with their wives, verses 22 to 33. Children with their parents, chapter 6, 1 to 4. And even bondservants with their masters, chapter 6, 5 to 9. So Paul's calling for a whole new humanity. All together, we're radically different people, like, like Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, black and white, Men and women, husbands and wives, children and parents, and even slaves and their masters get along famously in a whole new community called the church. And of course, the devil's not going to like that very much, is he? He's going to wage war against that reality, isn't he? Which is why Paul transitions in chapter 6, verse 10. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. God's armor, not your armor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, verse 14. Put on the shoes of peace, verse 15. Put on the shield of faith, verse 16. Put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, verse 17. Why do I need to put on all that? Because it's wartime. It's not peacetime, church. It's wartime. Who's doing the fighting? What exactly are we fighting for? Well, be clear, Paul is still writing to the church. He didn't shift gears in chapter 6, verse 10, and he'd say, hey, to you individual, I just want to say to you. No, he's writing to the church. He's still writing to the church. He's writing to us corporately, to the saints in Ephesus who are faithful in Christ Jesus. This is not an individual Christian putting on individual armor of God. No. It's the church gathered together as the people of God standing firm against the schemes of the devil who's a liar and a deceiver, the one who comes only to steal and kill and destroy, John 10, 10. And look around because he's doing a pretty good job, isn't he? Tearing down the church. But how? What's his strategy? Well, I believe it's through 
two efforts. Number one, false doctrine. Declaring things that are not true. They're always close, though, aren't they? There's part truth in them, but that's not whole truth. That's what makes it compelling. And it perverts the truth, and it pulls you away from the truth. False doctrine. Then here's a second scheme. Us fighting internally with ourselves. Either way, he doesn't care, right? He, he's not like, well, I want to have a balanced approach strategy here. You know, He doesn't care. He doesn't care which one is most effective, false doctrine or fighting amongst ourselves. Either way, he doesn't care. As long as we're not proclaiming the good news of the gospel so that other people can come to faith and grow in grace. How does he do that? By bringing disunity. Just think with me about this. It's so true and it's so relevant. He brings disunity so that the church becomes ugly. The church is supposed to be glorious right? They should see our love for one another and glory in the reality that God has transformed these people. Even though they don't know each other at all, they come from radically different backgrounds, and yet there's a love for one another that cannot be denied. But when there's disunity, the church becomes ugly, which in turn causes the message to be tainted. So rather than the beauty of the church being the foundation on which we proclaim the beauty of Christ, it's not there. First thing people see when they come into a church is the way people get along. The last thing they see when they leave the church is how people get along. In the middle is the preaching. You walk into a church and there's no joy, there's no love for one another, they don't even seem like they know one another, then the preaching of the word is not having its good effect. There's two great commandments, aren't they? Love God and love one another. If we don't love one another, then it's because we don't love God. Do you see how that works? The beauty of the church is the foundation on which we proclaim the beauty of Christ. And in proclaiming the beauty of Christ, it results in the beauty of the church. So what do we do with all that? What do we do with the book of Ephesians before we transition into 12 reasons Jesus came to die this summer? What do we do so that this sanctuary this morning does not become an amnesia room where you walk out and you forget everything that you heard? How do we make sure that doesn't happen? Two things stand out to me. The first is that we make sure, first and foremost, that we're actually in Christ. And that we're living individually for the glory of Christ. So if you're here this morning and that's not clear to you, then I appeal to you to put your faith in the Lord Jesus, because it's only in him that you can be blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that you can be adopted into his family, that you can have redemption, that you can have the forgiveness of sins, that you can be sealed with the Spirit who is the guarantor of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. If you just think I'm radical, Extreme. What is he yelling about? 
Maybe you're missing something. Maybe you're missing the main thing. Boy, you're so close to Christianity. But your faith is not actually in Jesus. I appeal to you, put your faith in Christ. Find your entire identity in Christ and in Christ alone. So not in other things. Not your work. Not your family. Not your hobbies or your career, what you do or what you're good at. Find your entire identity in Christ alone. Why would you do that? Well, because it's only in Christ that you're going to find fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. He's the only one who can satisfy your soul for all eternity. And the only one who can empower you to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. And I would suggest worthy of the church the body of believers that he's called us to be. So your life should not only be all about Christ, but it should be all about the church. Remember, be clear. The church is God's idea. It's not my idea. It's not some human institution. It's God's idea. It's God's eternal purpose that he would save a people for himself. And then he would call them to live in community. And in a community that is marked by love that is so radically different than the world around us. That people would see in that community the beauty of Christ. And the good work that he has done, is doing, and promises to continue to do until eternity in our lives. And yet... That's your individual responsibility to maintain. Being eager, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, with all humility and gentleness, bearing with one another, and working hard to build up one another in love. May we be faithful as a body of believers to fight for unity, to fight against the devil's lies, knowing his age-old schemes to divide and destroy, bringing false doctrine, and fighting within ourselves. So working hard to love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, overwhelmed by the beauty of Christ that results in the beauty of the church. Which is what Augustine declared so many years ago in the city of God. Christianity is not the problem. Let's not give them evidence in the world to say Christianity is the problem. No, Christianity is not the problem. The sinfulness of man is the problem. Religion is not found in loving the world nor the things in this world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But the one who does the will of God lives for the city of God, will abide with God as the people of God for all eternity. Jesus will rule and Jesus will reign over all things, over all empires. And only the church, the people of God, will stand triumphant in the end. May God give us the grace that we would glory in the beauty of Christ. But it would result in the beauty of this individual, local church for our good and for God's eternal glory. Allow me to pray. Father, we're asking that you would do a good work here this morning. That even as we review the book of Ephesians and all these things ring true in our minds that they would make 
their way from our minds to our hearts. Father, that we would glory in the beauty of Christ. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, give us grace to glory in the beauty of Christ and give us grace to work that out in the beauty of the church. Father, do that good work by the power of your spirit for our good and for your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.